Earlier this year, Colossal Biosciences, a Texas-based biotechnology company, announced a plan to de-exting the dodo. After having received an additional $150 million in funding, making the dodo the third animal the company chose to recreate, after the woolly mammoth and the thalassin. This additional investment would mean that Colossal has received a massive total of $225 million in funding, which came from various venture capitals, including ones run by the US government, all in support of bringing extinct animals back to life. These de-extinction plans aim to reintroduce extinct species back to their natural historical habitats as a form of rewilding. This means that we need to recreate an entire population of stable and self-sustaining numbers of individuals, not just one living specimen. The promising progress made in recent years and the massive effort put into bringing back extinct animals have shifted the big question from if it's really possible to if it's actually necessary for species conservation. We might be able to see the dodo, the thalassine, and the woolly mammoth alive in the future. But will we be able to restore them to their natural habitat? And will the reappearance of long-dead species actually benefit the ecosystem? De-extinction means bringing back an organism that has completely died out. And currently, there are several methods that can achieve that. Iterative evolution is a natural process that happens when a species becomes extinct, but then through convergent evolution, the extinct species' close relative evolves into an almost identical organism to fill the niche left out by the extinct species, virtually making the same animal reappear in the ecosystem. Other methods require human intervention. Backbreeding is a form of selective breeding that's the reverse of domestication, breeding animals for their ancestral characteristics. This method is only effective if the ancestral traits of the extinct species are still present in the genes of the extant population. And backbreeding can only achieve an organism that resembles its wild ancestors phenotypically. The resulting organism will have a notably distinct genome from its extinct ancestor. Cloning is the most widely proposed method and the only one that can recreate true genetically identical organisms to the target species. The process of cloning mammalian animals generally uses a method called somatic cell nuclear transfer. This is done by taking the nucleus from an adult cell of the target animal and inserting it into a donor egg from which the nucleus has been removed. The egg is then transferred into the uterus of the surrogate mother, where it will develop into an individual with the exact same nuclear genome to the target animal. To clone an extinct animal, a well-preserved cell sample of the target animal is needed, and a close living relative of the species will be used as both the egg donor and the surrogate mother. For example, in the cloning of the Pyrenean ibex, Spanish ibex and hybrid goats were used. Genome editing With the rapid advancements in genetic engineering, genome editing is starting to take center stage in resurrecting extinct animals. With the help of the CRISPR-Cas9 system, genes from a closely related species' germ cells can be edited directly to resemble those of the extinct one. These edited sperm and egg cells will then produce offspring of the extinct species. Or for mammals, living cells from a closely related extant animal can be edited, so that its genome will more closely resemble those of the target extinct species. And then the cell nucleus can be used in the somatic cell nuclear transfer method. Advancements in genome sequencing and assembly also enable us to reconstruct the genome of extinct species with no well-preserved cell samples and potentially resurrect species that have been extinct for much longer. Genome editing is the method that will be used by colossal biosciences to recreate the extinct animals. Asian elephant's DNA, the mammoth's closest living relative, will be used as the base from which the reconstructed mammoth's genes will be developed. 
For the dodo, the Nicobar pigeon's DNA will be used. For the thalassian, the donuts. And for the passenger pigeon, the band-tailed pigeons. Most extinct animal species will require some forms of genome assembly or gene editing before they can be resurrected. The product of all these methods, however, cannot give birth to an organism that is the 100% perfect replica to the ones that are extinct. Even in cloning, although the organism will share the identical nuclear genome from the target animal, the mitochondrial genes from the donor egg are passed on to the developing offspring, which will affect the cellular metabolism of the clone organism. Proxy species is what de-extinction offers, organisms that look and behave similar to the ones that have gone extinct. This blurs the definition of success in de-extinction. Is the creation of an organism that has the same general appearance enough? Or are we aiming for something that has the highest possible percentage of the same genomic content as the original species? If the goal of de-extinction is to reintroduce species to the world for the role they have in their ecosystem, then a precise replication is not necessary. An example is a project that aims to recreate aurochs, an extinct species of wild cattle in Europe. The new aurochs are being created through backbreeding certain breeds of modern cattle, so the result will only be a new breed of wild cattle with similar physical and behavioral characteristics to the original extinct species. The goal is to reintroduce these cattle in the aurochs historic range and fill the role as natural grazers in the ecosystem. Mammoth elephant hybrids, or cold-resistant elephants, have been proposed to be reintroduced into the Siberian tundra, in hopes that they will recreate a grassland ecosystem and maintain it, since grasslands in the region have been lost since the mammoths died out thousands of years ago. Bringing back grasslands into the region is expected to have positive impacts on biodiversity and the planet's climate by absorbing carbon from the atmosphere. Restoring biodiversity through the establishment of populations of proxies that are ecologically equivalent to the extinct species can increase ecosystem stability, enhancing the ecosystem's resilience in the face of environmental change. Proxy species re-establishment can also bring socio-economic benefits, either directly in the form of employment in the extinction projects and associated tourism, and indirectly through improvements in the ecosystem's productivity. The advancements in genetic engineering technologies acquired from the extinction projects can also help the conservation effort of currently endangered animals by boosting the genetic diversity of relic populations, increasing the species' resilience. This helps them recover from having dangerously low numbers of individuals and poor gene pools within the population. De-extinction can be associated with a positive utility, primarily via environmental benefits. But it doesn't come without any potential risks and unwanted outcomes. There are welfare concerns in relation to processes around the production of animal clones, both for the surrogate individuals utilized in the production process and the produced proxies. These concerns become much more consequential when the surrogates used are already an endangered species. Although the creation of proxy animals for attractions or lab tests can still become a source of scientific knowledge, entertainment, education, and technological advancement, the end goal needs to achieve conservation benefits to justify the costs. The proxies of extinct species will have to be translocated to their suitable habitats where they will be free to interact with other species. De-extinction, in large part, is a conservation translocation or species reintroduction issue. Species reintroduction is commonly done to restore locally extinct species to its old habitat, like the release and re-establishment of Eurasian beavers in several countries in Europe, and the reintroduction of black-footed ferrets in North American countries. Reintroduction biology is still being continuously tested and worked on. This far, species reintroduction programs around the globe have seen mixed results. Predators, food availability, competition with other species, and weather 
can all affect the reintroduced population's ability to survive and reproduce. In China, the reintroduction of captive pandas hasn't been going particularly well. To date, out of nine released pandas, two failed to survive. One died in a fight for territory with other wild pandas, and the other died from sickness. Thorough evaluation of the availability of suitable habitat for the target species is a key component of reintroduction planning. Continued monitoring, assessment, and care of released individuals are then required to make sure that the post-release performance is progressing as intended. Even for extant species, reintroducing captive raised animals back into the wild can be challenging. For long extinct animals, creating functional proxies as well as establishing their population in the wild will be significantly more difficult, especially in species that require a large number of individuals in a population to survive, such as the passenger pigeon. To create just a single viable passenger pigeon population, a million birds might be required. And for the mammoth, with a gestation period of nearly two years and at least 10 years to reach sexual maturity, it will take many decades to generate enough individuals for a self-sustaining population. Once enough individuals have been produced, there is still no guarantee that they can be seamlessly reintroduced to their former habitat without creating further disturbances in the local ecosystem. Due to uncertainties from genetic and external factors, proxy species, once released to the wild, might have major unforeseen impacts on its ecosystem. There are risks of invasiveness, human-wildlife conflict, and unknown pathogenic interactions caused by the release of proxy organisms. The newly created proxy animals might become a novel vector for diseases, which might spread contagion further to other species in the ecosystem and even to humans. And there is also a small but non-negligible risk of inadvertent resurrection of ancient pathogens, endogenous retroviruses that reside in the genomes of the target species. The susceptibility of the proxy individuals to modern diseases and parasites must also be taken into consideration. The extinct organisms stopped co-evolving with their pathogens at the point of extinction. Revived individuals might have an increased susceptibility to modern diseases. If disease immunity isn't properly developed, the entire revived population might get wiped out by a single epidemic. The creation and release of proxy species will carry both financial and opportunity costs. These costs must be balanced against the expected conservation benefits. The protection and enhancement of existing biodiversity must remain as the priority. Bringing back a handful of iconic species, as exciting as it sounds, won't compensate for the thousands, if not millions, of other species that we have driven to extinction. De extinction must only proceed with a primary focus on preserving biodiversity. To date, $75 million have been raised for the funding of the Mammoth Project alone by Colossal Biosciences. This funding partially came from taxpayer dollars through a venture capital firm funded by the CIA. These same millions of dollars could have been directed to the conservation of currently endangered species and potentially prevent them from going extinct in the first place. The extinction programs are very expensive. Huge amounts of resources, not just money, but also scarce human resources, are required for preparation, transport and release, and post-release management of proxy species. Resources that would otherwise be applied to conservation of extant species. The economic aspect of the extinction isn't only resource management and funding but also the fact that proxy species creation can be pursued for commercial gain rather than for conservation benefits. The selection of the de-extinction candidates this far has only focused on popular and iconic animals. It's anyone's best guess if these choices aren't affected by personal or commercial interests. Proponents of de-extinction argue that de-extinction programs will not divert public attention away from conservation of currently endangered animals, 
and will instead boost awareness and public interest in protecting biodiversity. The popular animals are used to draw in public attention and raise funding, while the overall benefits will not be limited to only the resurrected species. However, public support for species conservation has been built around a sense of urgency and loss. The availability of the extinction technology might reinforce a false sense of complacency that extinction is not forever and is reversible. This might lead to reduced support for conservation. The risk of project failure, re-extinction, is still high, mostly if the threat that caused the extinction of the original species has not yet been properly addressed. Molecular biology is advancing rapidly. It makes de-extinction sound closer and closer to reality. But de-extinction still faces many challenges, both technical ones in the lab and ones related to proxy species re-establishment in the wild. De-extinction carries potential benefits, but also risks. There is a lot that can go wrong with bringing back extinct animals. We should ensure that de-extinction is pursued responsibly and carefully to minimize unwanted outcomes and ultimately achieve its proposed goal, restoring biodiversity and creating a stable ecosystem where de-extinction is inherently never needed.